Okay, we want to go ahead and talk about some of the different innovations that took place uh, following our, our movement westward into the Great Plains and the, the, the frontier life. Uh, really, as the frontier life comes to an end, you start to get the emergence of an urban culture, uh, and that has a lot to do with uh, a lot of the industri industry that was developing uh, in the mid to late 1800s, uh, revolving around the railroad, revolving around um, other mechanical developments, and then from that, from that industrialization, the development of the modern labor movement as workers begin to organize themselves uh, as a response to the large capital, the large investments, capital being money, um, what we're referencing primarily there, or the wealthy. So the working man versus the wealthy, the working and, and the wealthy. Uh, the wealthy were really created by a lot of in innovation. There were huge innovations taking place around this time. Um, guys like Edwin L. Drake, who uh, was the guy who really uh, uh, is responsible for, for discovering oil and petroleum in Pennsylvania and figuring out how to extract it from the ground. Um, guys like Bessemer who developed a, a way of, of injecting air into, uh, into molten metal uh, to make modern steel and the Bessemer process making, uh, making it possible to mass produce steel. Guys like Thomas Alva Edison uh, and his inventions surrounding specifically electricity uh, and the light bulb. Guys like Alexander Graham Bell developing, um, uh, of course, uh, the telecommunications industry. And, and again, these, these things have long-reaching effects. In the case of Thomas Alva Edison, uh, founding a company called GE, General Electric, which is still a massive company today. Uh, and of course, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, Bell Telephone, which eventually uh, turns into AT&T. These are massive companies uh, till this day. And from these innovations, again, you have the growth of captains of industry, uh, super wealthy people uh, who were able to take advantage of large amounts of resources and large amounts of labor uh, with uh, to develop a huge amount of money to go ahead and invest and develop these industries. Guys like Andrew Carnegie who develops Carnegie Steel uh, and really develops the idea of a vertically integrated company. Uh, what does that mean? That means Andrew Carnegie wasn't satisfied with just owning the steel mill. He wanted to go ahead and own the facility to sell his steel so he could control that. He could control the marketing. He wanted to own the, the mines where the iron ore came from. He wanted to own the ships that brought the iron ore. So from the moment that iron ore was, was extracted from the ground to the moment it was sold to the, uh, to the end user, Carnegie controlled the whole process uh, of steel. And that was the idea of a vertical integrated company. Uh, and a lot of companies start to go ahead and, and develop this. Ford Motor Company used it. Um, you know, uh, the oil industry used it. Uh, this was the model that, that really developed these very large companies. But along with that, along with that great wealth, guys like Andrew Carnegie were also philanthropists, meaning that they gave away a lot of their money to charitable causes. And in fact, a lot of the charitable organizations, the charitable foundations that we have today trace their roots right back to these captains of industry. Um, were it not for them, a lot of the things that we think of today um, a lot of the organizations that we have around today that we are part of our culture would not exist. Uh, guys like J.D. Rockefeller who found Standard Oil, uh, which today is, is split up into uh, companies like Exxon, uh, Mobil's part of that, uh, Amoco, or what used to be Amoco is part of that, Chevron, Standard Oil California, um, Sohio, those were all part of his monopoly on oil and the old Standard Oil. And it's from that huge wealth of J.D. Rockefeller that he founds the University of Chicago, the Chicago Symphony. Uh, it's his money that enables all of that. And J.D. Rockefeller further comes up with the idea that Standard Oil is a holding company where he's going to buy up all these other companies uh, and, and, and basically control the oil market. And, and he develops a monopoly. Uh, another guy who really develops this concept is a banker, J.P. Morgan. And he was really financed, and that was his deal, too. He was trying to develop a way to develop a monopoly, and he founds U.S. Steel that will eventually go out and buy out Carnegie Steel uh, and eventually start to consolidate uh, all of the steel companies under one banner, again, that being U.S. Steel. You guys are familiar with the symbol for U.S. Steel to this day? I'm, I'm assuming if you've ever watched the NFL uh, and, and the Pittsburgh Steelers, the symbol, the logo on the side of their helmet is the logo for U.S. Steel. Uh, so these, these companies are hugely influential. At one time, uh, guys like J.P. Morgan, wealthiest guy in the country, uh, it's estimated that his, with his fortune he could have bought at fair market value every piece of property west of the Mississippi. Again, tremendous wealth that these guys possessed. And in response to that tremendous wealth, you have the organization of labor where workers are trying to go ahead uh, and 
and say, look, okay, you guys have this huge amount of wealth, but but we don't, and 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 we've worked hard for for your wealth, and so some of that should be shared more equitably with us. Guys like Eugene V. Debs, Samuel Gompers, they were all guys who who really drew a lot of their inspiration from Karl Marx and the systems of socialism and communism. Uh, the idea that the idea that again, you know, property wasn't necessarily something that one person owned. It was something that society as a whole built. It wasn't just one person who built Standard Oil, who built um, Carnegie Steel, at least not according to Karl Marx. It was it was the society that built that. Um, and again, pretty controversial. And a lot of Americans recoiled at this and did not like that idea. We're very much an independent people traditionally. And, and yeah, we do believe we, we that our work builds those things, that it's, it's through our efforts. Uh, and yeah, we might employ others but without without the the person there driving it, the the, the Carnegies, the the Rockefellers, then then nobody mobilizes all of that labor. And so uh, again, they had a hard sell. Those guys, Debs and, and Gompers, and they weren't very popular figures for a long time. Uh, early early examples of their of their efforts include uh, protests like the Haymarket Affair it takes place in Chicago in May fourth of eighteen eighty six. Uh, approximately twelve hundred protesters gather in what at the time was Haymarket Square. Uh, today it's down by where you'd see the Dirksen Federal Building um, in Chicago. Um, and, and by all accounts, most of the protests went very, very well. It was a cold day. It was a wet day. It was raining a little bit. Uh, there were speakers there. About 1,000, like I said, 200 people showed up. The speakers went off without a hitch. And as, as the crowd is dispersing, somebody from in the crowd tosses, a, a, if today you'd call it a, an IED, an improvised explosive device. It's probably like a Molotov cocktail, a a, a a bottle filled with some type of flammable fluid with a uh, some kind of wick, like a rag to, stuffed in it. Uh, threw that at the police. The police front turned fire, uh, wounding and killing some of the protesters. And it turns into a, a huge story as part of the labor movement uh, and, and the stress between the labor, the, the workers, and the capital, the wealthy.